Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I would also like to acknowledge that we're gathered on the traditional land of the Wadawurrung people and honour and pay our respects to their elders, past and present. Uh, this year, Geelong Football Club celebrates its 160th year. This is an exciting year for us in the context of our club's long and great history and an important milestone in the history of the game of Australian rules football. We are the second oldest continuous professional sporting club in the world behind Melbourne Football Club, who were formed in 1858, though not all historians agree on the date of their creation. Professor Geoffrey Blaney records the oldest football clubs in the world as Melbourne 1858, Geelong 1859, Notts County in England in 1862, Stoke City in England, 1863, Carlton, 1864, and Nottingham Forest, 1865. To put it in some sort of chronological context in the broader picture of the history of Australia, the Geelong Football Club was founded only 71 years after the establishment of the very first colony at Sydney Cove. William Buckley, who lived with the Wathaurong people in the Geelong district for over 30 years, died in Tasmania in 1856 just three years before our club was born. Our club was founded in the same year that Charles Darwin first published his revolutionary work, The Origin of Species. The American Civil War started one year after the formation of our club in 1860. The Suez Canal opened in 1869. Alexander Graham Bell's patent for the telephone was registered 17 years later in 1876. Radio was invented in 1879, which is, incidentally was a premiership year for the Geelong Football Club, just 20 years after the creation of our club. And of course we all know that radio was invented for the sole purpose of enabling 3GL to broadcast the football. <laughs> to loyal Geelong fans, and this year is actually uh, 3GL or k Rocks. Uh, 87th year of bringing uh, the football into our homes and they've become an integral part of uh, our football life and it's certainly been a great partnership. Some of the most famous sporting clubs in the world were not even a twinkling in their founder's eye the day that the Geelong Football Club was created. 33 years after Geelong Football Club was formed, Liverpool in England, or Liverpool Football Club was created 42 years later, Manchester United and the Boston Red Sox in America were born. 101 years after the Geelong Football Club, the Dallas Cowboys were formed. The discovery of gold in Ballarat in 1851 would bring about one of the greatest gold rushes in Australian history. In the 1850s, one third of all the world's gold was found in Victoria. People were flooding into Ballarat, nearby Geelong, and indeed into Australia to make their fortunes on the various gold fields around Victoria and those nearby to the Geelong Township. Geelong would be known as the pivot of the Western District and the commercial hub for the vibrant gold fields of Ballarat and nearby towns. The population of Geelong had grown from 8,000 in 1851 to around 23,000 by the mid-1850s. Geelong was alive and jumping. Opportunities were many, and it seemed that this area would be the land of opportunity for migrants, ticket-of-leave convicts, and others on a keen, a keen on a fresh start and a new life. Geelong was the ticket to the future. The pivot name stuck, and our football team would be known from that moment as the Pivotonians. So successful was Geelong as a settlement and the new commercial business for a burgeoning Victoria, some businessmen in Melbourne felt so threatened by Geelong's success that they created a false map in 1854 that showed Geelong was situated much further away from the goldfields than it actually was. In fact, this map, created at the hands of Melbourne business interests, incorrectly showed that Melbourne was much closer to Ballarat than Geelong was. And so 
All people arriving in Victoria for a new start in life were told that Geelong was located much further away from the exciting new goldfield opportunities than Melbourne was, and that they should invest their focus and their interest in Melbourne instead of Geelong, and so this great Melbourne and Geelong rivalry was born. James Harrison founded the Geelong Advertiser on November 21, 1840, and was still the proprietor and the printer of the paper in our foundation year, of 1859. One of Australia's brightest minds, Harrison had already invented refrigeration 15 years earlier, in 1844. And in 1856, he was commissioned with the very important task of building a machine that refrigerated beer. Also in 1856, a young man, aged 21, would return from England. Where he, had, where he attended rugby school. Young Tom Wills had been at rugby since the age of 14, where he had been sent by his father in the hope that he'd become a better ad academic student. Tom, however, loved sport above everything else, and he excelled on the sporting fields rather than in the classroom. During his time at rugby, he was also known as one of the best cricketers in England, and he relished his time on all of the football fields. Wills was born in New South Wales on the 19th of August in 1835 and he also lived at Lexington, a property at Moyston near Ararat in his childhood and spent much of his childhood years with the local Aboriginal children playing their games and speaking their language. Meanwhile, back in Geelong, the town was on the move. The longest railway in Australia at the time was the Geelong to Melbourne railway line. And that was built in 1857 in the expectation that it would further advance the development of the Geelong precinct which was growing. The wool business was booming and Geelong was the centre of it. On the 4th of June in 1858, the year preceding the birth of our club, Geelong was proclaimed a town. The future looked bright and Geelong was now the fourth biggest town in Australia. The following month, on the 10th of July in 1858, that boy from rugby school, Tom Wills, wrote his famous letter to the editor of Bell's Life, calling for the formation of a football club. And an excerpt of that letter read, Why can they not, I say, form a football club and form a committee of three or more to draw up a code of laws? If a club of this sort were got up, it would be of a vast benefit to any cricket ground to be trampled upon and would make the turf quite firm and durable. Besides which, it would keep those who are inclined to become stout <laughs> from having their joints encased in useless, superabundant flesh. <laughs> I remain yours truly, T.W. Wills. After this letter was published, Wills, Harrison, Hammersley and others went on to form the Melbourne Football Club and the first rules of the game of Australian football. Tommy Wills, who would later captain Geelong, certainly had a more than interesting family history. His grandfather had been sentenced to death in England for highway robbery. This sentence was later commuted to transportation for life to the colonies. In Geelong, his family had lived at Bellevue at Point Henry since 1853. That's it. Incidentally, we've now located the actual site of the Bellevue homestead at Point Henry, and we're currently in discussions with Alcoa, the National Trust, and the City of Greater Geelong with a view to installing a plaque on the site to commemorate the role the Wills family played in the history of Geelong and the history of the Geelong Football Club. In 1859, another momentous change to the Geelong district took place when Thomas Austin introduced 24 breeding rabbits, some hares and some blackbirds from England to his property at Barwon Park near Winchelsea for the purposes of entertaining he and his mates with a little hunting. Thomas Austin's son, A.A. A. Austin, would play for Geelong from 1973 up until 1881 where he would captain our premiership team in his last season. We're still trying to deal with Austin's rabbits, 
and approximately 200 million of their descendants right across Australia. <laughs> Thomas Austin's brother, James Austin, would feature later in the Geelong story when he was the part owner of the Argyle Paddock. Remember, with Silas Harding. Geelong played its matches at the Argyle Paddock, owned by Austin and Harding, which is roughly where the Argyle Hotel is today, now named Murphy's, I think, <coughs> in Aberdeen Street, near to the corner of Packington Street. So our occupancy of that ground ended abruptly in 1878 when our secretary, Mr Stephen, forgot to pay the rates, went on a holiday trip to England, and Silas Harding, the landlord, had the field ploughed up so that it was impossible for us to play. Football of several types was already being played in Geelong from the 1840s. A lot of people don't know that. And informal games resembled rugby, Gaelic football, association, which Roy will tell you that we later branded soccer, um, and the indigenous game played amongst the locals, and hybrids of all of these. There were all sorts of football games happening with all different sorts of styles. A famous local identity at the time was a bloke called William Stitt Jenkins, who was a poet, social activist, and a temperance worker. He came from the old England school that firmly believed in the backbone of the empire being men of great fitness, healthy mind, healthy body, and of course, abstinence. He pioneered the establishment of gymnastics clubs in the town and he was a leading figure and a social commentator in the Geelong landscape in the 1850s. On April the 21st in 1859, the Geelong Advertiser reported, we notice that Mr Stitt Jenkins is going in now for the establishment of a Saturday afternoon football club. Many such clubs will no doubt be established before cold weather sets in. That's Mr Stitt Jenkins on the phone just now. The game is one of the healthiest and easiest that could be adopted by persons cramped during the week by desk or counter service and standing in need of a little bracing exercise. We would far rather see the teetotalers forming themselves into rival football clubs and kicking each other's shins <laughs> in good fellowship than receive ill-natured letters from their rival factions accusing one another of satanic influence. There's plenty of bile just now in the Geelong teetotal body for which a good field day at football or hockey would be an infallible curative. <laughs> Stitt Jenkins also led the formation of the Recreation Society which he hoped would provide activities and pastimes to distract the population from the demon drink. There was a fountain erected in his honour in the original Market Square in Geelong for watering animals in the town and that fountain still exists today and it's in Johnson's Park, amazingly. It's not known what role Stitt Jenkins actually played, if any, in the, in the ultimate creation of our club, but his suggestion, uh, initial suggestion, is the first that I could find of anyone referring to the establishment of a football club in Geelong. On July 16, 1859, an ad appeared in the Geelong Advertiser. Football. Admirers of the above are requested to attend a meeting to be held at the Victoria Hotel at half past seven on Monday evening, the 18th of July, A.M. Mason, Secretary. In researching this, uh, our first year of life as a football club, I wasn't certain about the actual location of the Victoria Hotel. The Victoria Hotel that I knew was where Daryl Lee Chocolates is today, you know, in uh, Mallop Street. And it was built well after 1900. Now, when I was very young and good looking, my very first job in 1969, after leaving school, was at the Commonwealth Bank on the corner of Mirable Street and Mallop Street, where I started as a bank clerk. The Victoria Hotel was next door. And I remember it well because when the bank shut at 3pm, which were the 
closing hours in those days, some of the tellers and men who were of age would exit via the second floor back door of the bank, onto the fire escape, down into the back door of the Victoria Hotel for what they called afternoon tea. <laughs> anyway, last year I found this photo, which was taken in 1913, and it shows the original Victoria Hotel on the corner of Mirable and Mallet, and the new one being built, still under construction, next door where Daryl Lee Chocolates is today in Mallop Street. And so for me, the mystery was solved. And so the very first meeting of the Geelong Football Club was held on the 18th of July at 7.30pm at the Victoria Hotel and the meeting was minuted. And the Daily News reported the meeting the following day. Pursuant to advertisement, a meeting was held at the Victoria Hotel last evening for the purpose of forming a football club. And the Geelong athletes may now congratulate themselves on having an opening for healthy exercise during the winter months. And the following resolutions were put and carried. That a football club be formed in Geelong under the style of the Geelong Football Club. That the subscription be stated at two shillings and sixpence. It's gone up a bit. <laughs> per member, subject to alteration that the rules of the club be the same as those of the Melbourne Football Club, that Mr Mason be appointed the Honorary Secretary and Treasurer, that the first meet be held at the Port Arlington Hotel on Saturday next, sharp, two o'clock, when a ball and boundaries will be provided and that a meeting be held to consolidate the club. And so the club was born Alexander Mason was elected the inaugural secretary and treasurer. On July 18, in just a few weeks' time, our Honouring the Past team will be installing a plaque on the building on the corner of Mirable and Mallop Street to commemorate the birth of our club. The first ever scratch match was scheduled for the following Saturday, July 23, 1859, at 2 p.m. It's a bit hard to see this map um, on this screen, but if you'd like to come down to and then look at this one, you'll see it on this map on the easel a bit later. But the game, that very first scratch match, was played on open ground between the Port Arlington Hotel. The Port Arlington Hotel was nowhere near Port Arlington. The Port Arlington Hotel used to be around uh, Sydney Parade. And the ground behind that was actually the ground to the north of it. So the game was played on open ground between the Port Arlington Hotel and the Corio Cricket Ground. The Port Arlington Hotel was located on the north side of Sydney Place West, which is now Sydney, Ave Sydney Avenue east of the Geelong CBD. So it wasn't played out at Corio Oval, it was actually played around about where Pevensey Crescent is. The Daily News reported on the game, in which about 20 players took part. Teams were chosen by the captains, Fraser and Mason. The paper reported that Fraser picked all the big uns, <laughs> and Mason selected the light infantry. The new game was played with great enthusiasm and vigour, and reports also mentioned that players on both sides performed a series of unpremeditated gymnastic feats. And also that some laughable mistakes occurred during this match. Several of the players evidently labouring under the delusion that their mission was merely to kick without taking into consideration the proper direction in which to propel the ball. <laughs> Fraser's team won the day through their bulk and their strength. The game lacked nothing in enthusiasm and exuberance but lacked a little in the skill and the artistry area. A second scratch match was played on the same day, straight after, with Fraser's bigger built team, again the victors. The Geelong Advertiser reported, the species of inaugural football match which came off on Saturday afternoon was a great success. And that there was 
just enough barking of shins to give an extra twinge of excitement to the day's sport. And the hour left no room for doubt that the Geelong Football Club will ripen into an institution and fully answer the purpose for which it has been formed. Immediately after the matches, a meeting was held at the Port Arlington Hotel, of course, to appoint a committee of play and for the admission of new members. And in relation to the membership, the Daily News also reported that it was proposed and carried that respectable and well-behaved persons be eligible for admission without reference to social position, which was interesting. The following Saturday on July 30, the Daily News again reported on the meeting that would take place that afternoon again at the rear of the Port Arlington Hotel. And again, this indicates that that playing area was uh, to the north of the hotel between Sydney Parade and the Pevensey Park. The paper also reported that a couple of bona fide footballs have arrived from Melbourne, real ones, which are warranted to stand any amount of kicking without damage. The Daily News reported that the captains for the day were Rennie and Fraser. The secretary, Mr Mason, had provided a new ball for the game as promised, a larger ball than the players had been used to during, and during this hard fought match, the ball was driven down to the immigration depot. And again, you'll see later that it features on that map which was southwest of what we believe was the playing era. Remember that the game took place again at the rear of the Port Arlington Hotel. And the paper also reported that after a vast expenditure of bodily exertion, several kissed Mother Earth in a most undignified manner. <laughs> the two teams were very evenly matched and after a fast and furious struggle, the game ended in a scoreless draw. The Daily News also declared after the game there was a manifest improvement in the style of play. And if the Geelong Football Club carries through the season in the same spirit with which it has begun, it promises fair to become a first class and effective club. By August 1859, the Melbourne rules, which were those drafted by the Melbourne Football Club in May earlier in the year, were more or less adopted by Geelong and other clubs uh, generally. Up until this time, most clubs had their own rules, which led to a lot of confusion in the playing of the developing and changing game. The third week of scratch matches was again played near the Port Arlington Hotel. The game was not well attended because of the arrival of the mail ship from England. Such was the excitement on any news from home, not as many players turned up to play as was hoped. Mason and Rennie were again the captains and they chose their sides. Play went on for two hours without a score. Two hours without a score. <laughs> uh, and the game ended in a draw. The following Saturday, August 13, the Daily News reported, the Geelong Football Club in 10 meeting in great force today on their ground near the Port Arlington Hotel. Several gentlemen who from the arrival of the English Mail and other causes, were absent last Saturday, having signified their intention of joining today's sport, a pleasant afternoon may be prognosticated. <laughs> a new innovation was implemented for this game with the addition of a row of white flags to mark the boundary of what I think would have been a rectangular ground. Back in those days, I think there are about 250 metres by 150 metres, thereabouts. The teams were selected and captained by Blackham and O'Ryan. Mind you, Francis O'Ryan was the publican of the Port Arlington Hotel in 1859, and he had a pecuniary interest in things going well for the football club with this new game that was just happening out the back of his back door. One player who featured prominently in this game was John Middlemiss who was the secretary of the Geelong Infirmary and maybe a distant relation of our Russ Middlemiss, our great premiership player of the 1950s. The Daily News also reported on the game on the following Monday. 
On being again brought into play during which the ball got into all sorts of inaccessible and out of the way places, now flying over a four bedroom cottage, and anon quietly taking a rest in a washerwoman's water barrel. Fences innumerable were cleared in steeplechase style in its own eccentric manner, closely followed in all its gyrations by the rival players. So even in those days, the oval footy had them dazzled, don't you think? It was bouncing all over the place. John Middlemiss featured again when he took the ball in first-rate style through the Orions and here a large dog, evidently in the, ploy, in the employ of the latter, put in an appearance and rushing past Blackham, who had a good lead and was close to an almost undefendable goal, fairly snatched the victory from him by running away with the ball, <laughs> thus allowing the Orion side once to defer the result. In consequence of the players being numerically small, the work was very severe and several gentlemen sat down on the scene of their exertions. <laughs> Where's Harry? Do you have a lie down, Harry, during the game? <laughs> Leaving the issue of the game to their more active compatriots. Can you imagine that? No, I'm tired. <laughs> Having a lie down, I'm tired. It was reported that the game lasted for about an hour and a half and Blackham's team won the match by one goal to nil. After a 10 minute break, a second game was scheduled immediately after, where Rennie and Smith as captains selected their teams and they played until dusk without a goal being scored. The Daily News wrote, we would recommend the members of the club provide themselves with reversible caps, say blue and pink, so that such might more readily distinguish friends from opponents. So you can have a reversible cap, you know, a blue one and on the inside it's pink, so you just, depending on which team you play, you just change the cap around. Now on the following Saturday, August 20, the Daily News, which had taken on the mantle of reporting on the new sport of football and the creation of the Geelong Football Club, published its last edition of the paper. The proprietors cited the non-payment of debts owed to them by others as the main reason for the paper's closure and a situation that they suggested only existed in Geelong. Bit unfair. The Geelong Advertiser, the major paper in the growing Geelong town, didn't take up the running of continuing the football news and so the balance of the season of Geelong's first year was unreported. On this Saturday, the Daily News, however, knowing that it was the last edition it would ever print, still gave mention to the fifth and last reported scratch match in 1859. The goals will be fixed this afternoon, in brackets Saturday, at two o'clock. Play to commence at half past sharp. Members are requested to attend. Mason, Honorary Secretary. The following year on September, 1st of September in 1860, the very first formal game that Geelong ever played was against Melbourne at the Argyle ground. And Geelong's captain that day was Alex Mason. Remember the fellow that put that first ad in the paper back on July 15 in 1859. There were 25 men on each team and the match ended in a scoreless draw. <laughs> 50 blokes running around and we couldn't get a goal. And that was only after three hours of play. <laughs> to date, we've been able to name 28 of the players who played in that very first year of 1859. We've already mentioned a few in the, uh, of the players, including John Middlemiss, the secretary of the Geelong Infirmary, which later became the Geelong Hospital. Another one of those first 28 players was the Reverend George Oakley Vance. Now this photo was taken two years after he stopped playing. 
He was a big unit. Now, George Oakley Vance was the very first principal of the Geelong Grammar School in its foundation year of 1855. He was born in London in 1828 and claimed to be a direct descendant of Robert the Bruce, King of Scotland. Another student to attend grammar on the inaugural day back in 1855 was Percival Champion. He would also go on and play for Geelong in the very first season in 1859. It's interesting to note that a Galbraith played in that first game. And it may be that this fellow was John Galbraith, the Scottish father of our future player, Jim Galbraith, who played in 1885 to 1887 and the ancestor of Hugh Seawood, one of our current directors of the football club. Now this is a list, which is again hard to see, I apologise for that, but this is a list which is not definitive, but it's the best that we've been able to put together of the 28 players that we knew played in that first year. And so the 1859 year and the years leading up to it formed the basis upon which our football club and indeed our city was built. Geelong as a town and a city has faced many challenges since its inception. But we've always seemed to overcome adversity and we've always seemed to find our own way. It's no coincidence that the great men and women who built this city and this region are more often than not mentioned in the pages of our club's history books. The story of our football club has run parallel with the fortunes of our city and it's difficult to imagine another city or another community in Australia or in the world having a closer, more integrated link with its football team than we do here in Geelong. Our football club is part of our city's fabric. It's part of our DNA. From the creation of the game 161 years ago to what it is now acknowledged Australia-wide as the best regional sporting stadium in the country. Geelong's story is one for us to all be very proud of. For we are Geelong and we are the greatest team of all. Thank you.